This is Zeno Robinson, the voice of Cyborg, and you're listening to Whelmed, The Young Justice Files. Recognized, Emily of Arden, D, 1, 2. Recognized, Potty of 1, D, 1, 4. Hello team. Today in the Watchtower, we welcome back the wonderful Jeff Stormer. You may remember him from his previous appearances on Whelm, discussing Superman, Ted Cord, and a whole lot more, if you listen to those episodes. But if this is your first time tuning in, here's a little refresher on who Jeff is. Jeff is a podcaster, tabletop RPG writer, and a man with an actual college degree in comic books. He's the host of the Party of One podcast, where he and a variety of awesome guests play two-person tabletop RPGs. You may have heard me, Rich, or Neil play a couple of different games over there if you pay attention to the things we share on Twitter as well as the co-host of the fantasy world-building podcast, All My Fantasy Children. And if that wasn't enough, he's created like almost a dozen different indie RPGs, including the upcoming superhero game, Anyone Can Wear the Mask. Jeff, I am so happy to welcome you back to Whelmed. I am so happy to be here. Thank you for having me, Emily. Uh, This is what, our third time recording podcasts together? Like, I'm excited for that. I'm excited for my third appearance on Whelmed. Like, this is just, this is a real highlight of my day. So thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Thanks for coming. And this is my, this is my first Whelmed recording with you. I've been on two episodes of Party of One, both telling fun superhero stories. This is true. This is very true. (laughs) Extremely true. Synergy. (laughs) We've got, it's the, it's about the brand is what it is. (laughs) We're very on brand here. But before we begin, I want to remind everyone that our discussion episodes draw on anything and everything related to Young Justice, including all three seasons so far, the comics, the video game, possibly the audio play. Like, that's also a thing that's that's in our wheelhouse now. There's a lot of Young Justice content in the world. So if you have not seen, read, or played all of the material and you are spoiler wary, consider this your warning. And with all that, that out of the way... Let's dive in. So Let's I t- do it. <laughs> so I touched on a few things in the intro, and you and Rich talked about a whole lot of stuff the last couple of times that you were here. But could you tell us a little bit more about who you are and what you do? Absolutely. Thank you for asking. I am, as you mentioned, I am a podcaster, tabletop RPG designer, and I am the unofficial official LARP designer of the Olive Garden restaurant. Um Relevant to this podcast, I, as you mentioned, I am someone with a literal actual degree in comic books. I majored in English uh, at Ohio State and they had a comic book research library. It's actually (coughs) the first and possibly only comic book research library in the country. I don't remember if there are any that have come up since then. But like uh, so I was able to literally just study comics as my kind of English major focus And I don't get to use that that knowledge of comics history often. So, like, I look forward to really this podcast more than any other is my opportunity to actually do what I (laughs) what I, you know, went to school for for four years. But um, I'm also the host of Party of One, which is an actual play podcast focused on two player role playing games, as well as all my fantasy children, which is a character creation, storytelling and world building podcast powered by listener prompts. And the other thing that is relevant to this uh, conversation that we are going to have, as you mentioned, is I am currently uh, I've I've designed and I'm guessing at the time of this episode, either released or near to release a new game called Anyone Can Wear the Mask, which is a small group superhero role playing game about a superhero, a supervillain and the city that they share. And so it is a game designed to tell stories about like a hero protecting their city or their neighborhood in the vein of Spider-Man or Superman when he's in Metropolis or Batman and Gotham. Like it is that very specific down home neighborhood superhero vibe. The Flash, I was talking about it on Twitter today. (laughs) The Flash is like the exact niche of what I'm going for with the game. And I think I've done a pretty good job of like hitting it. Nice. Um, and we will get into anyone can wear the mask. We will get into that in a little bit. Uh, I'm very excited to talk about it. 
Um, so when did you first see Young Justice? Because we do ask everyone that, and it's been a little while. So let's let's refresh. Let's, let's when did you first it. see Young Justice? Uh, after so uh, the the most accurate timeline I can use for it is after Rich had yelled about getting people to watch it on Twitter for about a year. For reference, that's about when I watched it. Um, it wasn't it's long the Rich before. Timeline. Yes, the Rich Howard timeline, which is the timeline that I care about. That's the only one that matters to me. Um, I'd say really closely, really close to when season three got announced was when I started watching it. Nice. Because I remember it wasn't long after I like finished the series that season three was announced. So I didn't have to go through years <laughs> of, of waiting. Uh, I went through a few months of it and then we got the announcement. I, I distinctly remember we got the announcement at Medi I think it was at Metatopia weekend because I believe we all yelled at Rich on Twitter <laughs> about it specifically. Um but yeah, it was probably not long before season three was announced and uh, we had held off on it for years and years because, you know, we're not we all make mistakes. <laughs> and the truth is, like, I was such a I was such a diehard fan of Justice League and Justice League Unlimited and the entire kind of Bruce Tim DC universe yeah. that like after that show ended. I just like couldn't quite commit to a new thing like the fact that it wasn't what i had already like gone through put like turned me off of it immediately and i was like i can't commit to this and then when i finally did like i i was like i could have been watching this from the start could have been watching this all along this could have been my show because almost immediately like um as i as i talked about on the first time we did well like i am nothing if not a a super fan of the work of Jack Kirby. And pretty much as soon as uh, my wife, Jen, who produces Party of One and I sat down and watched episode one where Cadmus is there and the Manhattan Guardian is there. We both sat back and went, are they doing the new gods? Is this the new gods? I'm pretty sure they're doing the new gods. And then like watched it through. And then at the end of season two, when Darkseid shows up, we're like, <laughs> called it. <laughs> Nothing but net swoosh. Because it was two seasons of that's the forever people. They're gonna do. They're gonna do new gods. Dark side's <laughs> gonna show up. There they are. That's random right there. That's glorious Godfrey. There he is right there. And then when Dark Side <laughs> finally shows up, we sat back and looked at each other and went, "We got it. We called it." And then paused for a moment and went, "Oh, that's the last episode that we can watch. Oh, you. Oh, you monsters. <laughs> How dare you!" <laughs> and then and then shortly after that, I remember we didn't live in that space for very long before season three got announced. Yes, you didn't. You didn't have to deal with the five years of pain uh, that the rest not. of us went through. I did not. My my life was. I finished it and went. I'd love to see more of this. Yeah. And then and then they went. Here you go, Jeff Stormer. This is for you. You. We've been waiting for you, Jeff. And it was like, <laughs> thank you. I'm happy to be. Oh yeah. No. It's. It's so weird people getting hearing people get into Young Justice now who are like, yeah, no, I finished season three. I can't wait for season four to come out. And I'm like, right, that's the state <laughs> of the world now. That's you're like that's why. Like, oh yeah, you could just you could just do that. <laughs> I'm like, it's not we're desperately tweeting hashtags for years. I'm like, I remember the Saturday when the fi the finale premiered, and we we're all like, what do we do? What how do we move from here? <laughs> I, I can't imagine go like I because I remember it had to be maybe maybe like six months. It, like it was a few months. It wasn't like a hugely long time. It was less than a year. But I still remember at that time being like, how, how you can't just end on that. <laughs> what the hell? And like losing my mind because I was like, that's such a good cliffhanger that you can't just drop that. And being outraged that that was the last episode because it was so good and it's such a good reveal that I was furious that there wasn't more. And so, like, I can't imagine going through that for five years. Oh, but it but speaking of the everyone at Metatopia texting Rich at the same time, I distinctly remember getting the news because it was literally just my brother texting me while I was at an audition for something on a break <laughs> during an audition and my brother just texted Google Young Justice right now. And I'm like, what, 
why? <laughs> and I did and was like had it like an inter- internal just screaming and there was no one around who would have known what I was doing or what was going on. So I was just there full so, of so screaming. So you walked, you walked into the audition and went, excuse me, I'm going to do my best, but they just announced Young Justice season three. <laughs> Here we go. It was it was in a break between between doing things in a group audition. So I had like a moment of just being able to like breathe, but I had to text like three other people and just be like, you know what I'm screaming about. Yeah, uh, you get it. <laughs> Finding the people that you're like, I can scream about this with you and you need to you need to be available right now. So yes, no, that was an adventure. The season three announcement was an adventure across the what board. A, it clearly. was a moment. So we have we have touched on the fact that you have a degree in comic books. Yes. So that tells me that you do have a history with comic books before oh, Young God, Justice yeah. happened. Uh, but what was what was that in general? What was like your history with DC and comics and such? I have been reading comics as long as I can remember. I <laughs> just shy of learned to read on comic books, as I think a lot of of people like me have, like. But, I mean, comic books and superheroes were a thing that, like, I obsessed over for as long as I can remember. Uh, In high school, my number one career goal was to be a writer of comic books. And then I started college and started writing comic book scripts and went, wait, I hate this. (laughs) This this is miserable. I hate this so much. Like, the act of doing this is, is awful to me. So I stopped. And frankly, it's for the best because I have found other medium that like express myself in much more exciting and positive ways. But at the time, like that was my dream. And so there was this like that was why I ended up going to school for comic books was because I wanted to write comics. But then I got so I I fell in love with the academics of it and like learning the history of it and learning the stories of like Jack Kirby and Seagull and Sister and learning all of the various pieces of the behind the scenes lore that that became like a huge part of me and learning the intricacies of these characters and mythologies. So that's that's the background of like me reading comics in general is that like it was my entire kind of like my whole life of reading things and and telling these stories. And then like it always I mean, it didn't always come back to Superman like I was the. I'm going to say this and I need you to not I need you to not judge me when I say these words. I was the Superman is boring kid when I was like 15. I was the worst like, "Mm, I don't like it. See, the Flash is much cooler because he's not as powerful as Superman. And I'm like, and now I'm like, the Flash time travels. The (laughs) Flash time travels. What am I talking about? What are you talking about, past Jeff? I can't judge you. I think a lot of us go through that. I think there is a time somewhere in my history where I kind of felt that, but it was less, it was less like Superman's boring. This other hero is better. It was kind of a like, because uh, people know Young Justice was kind of my Mm -hmm. real introduction to superheroes. There was a part of me that like super Superman is boring because Superboy is so much more interesting. That's fair. That's, and in terms of Young Justice, you're not wrong. And I, I as someone that, uh, that lives and breathes Superman, A, they they do such a good job of making of, it is a very conscious creative decision on their part to not make Superman more interesting than Superboy. And B, turning Superman into kind of a deadbeat dad is my maybe my favorite Superman decision of the last 10 years. Like, the decision of him to just be like, I don't want anything to do with this. You are not my kid. This ain't my problem. Is such a... It, I, I mean, Emily, we're getting, we're getting hard into, into the, <laughs> into the discussion now. Because, like, that is such a good... It gets to the core of what I love about Superman so much. Which is that, like, he has all of this power. He does all of these amazing things. And at the end of the day, he is a very ordinary person. And, and that is such mm. a good ordinary reaction of, like... Wait, you're what? You're a clone. You're a clone of me made by my worst enemy. Yeah. And now you want me to raise you? No, nah, I'm good. It makes sense. It's Superman being like, I had no choice in this happening. I don't really want to be part of this right now. I'm just gonna fly off and be elsewhere. It's such a it's such a disappointing like character decision that feels at once so character perfect and like it's it's disappointing in a way that feels 
intentional, which is such a yeah. such a tricky needle to thread to be to be like this is a character making a bad, hurtful, cruel, short sighted decision, and it's very specifically the the character doing that. Uh, like on the like the it is not the author like just being just being those things. It yeah. is us making a character do these things. That is such a difficult needle to thread and to do it in a way where you can look at it and be like i get where superman's coming from 100 percent is astoundingly well written it's so good but before before we go just full force into talking superman <laughs> and the and the ted talk that is letting jeff talk about superman let's talk a little bit about anyone can wear the mask because let's do it that i feel is just a direct result of a long history with comic books at the time we are recording this, anyone can wear the mask is not out yet. By the time this gets released, it will probably be out in the world and people will be able to find it. And we'll tell you where you can find it at the end of this episode. But what is anyone can wear the mask about in a little more detail? Uh, what mm -hmm. kind of superhero stories does it let you tell? And what comics and characters inspired it? Yeah, so... Uh, like I said, it is a three-person role-playing game. It is specifically for one, two, three people. Um, and it is about a hero, a villain, and a city. One player plays the hero. They are uh, a hero that is unflappable. Like, um, the core drama of the game is never whether or not the hero is going to successfully stop whatever threat is in front of them. They will just succeed. It is in the rules that they will always win. And so it is about like an unflappable hero who is tied to like a very specific place and the relationship that they share and the big sort of drama question of can the hero save everyone and what happens when the hero inevitably cannot save everyone. Yeah. So uh, it tells very it is in a lot of ways unabashedly my Superman game like unabashedly <laughs> in a lot of ways. This is my. Uh, you mentioned this is the result of reading a lot of comics. This is my academic essay on why <laughs> Superman is an interesting character translated into the medium of game design is the the least cool way that I can describe this game. But it's kind of my the most honest way that I can describe Jeff, this game. I wrote a 70 page honors thesis about Catwoman. That's a very cool way to describe a game. <laughs> All right, fair. <laughs> that this, th I say, I knew that you would understand where I'm coming from. I'm like, yeah, no, that's awesome. And someone else, someone else out in the world is probably like, that's boring and weird. And I'm like, dude, no, <laughs> I don't think you understand. Like, yeah, I don't. Don't at me. Do, whoever you are, do not at me. Role playing games can also be essays, and this no one true. can change my mind. <laughs> But yeah, it tells stories about like what happens when the unflappable, like ultimate hero can't save everyone and like it tells the story the relationship between a city of people and the hero that defends it the big reference points for it are like i said superman this is my superman game the other big pop culture reference for it is like the title suggests it is a spider-man game at heart uh it draws on a lot of playstation 4 spider-man and it is in a game that you play like you build locations and so you have Spider-Man zipping from place to place and neighborhood and neighborhood. Yeah. And really, truly, for me, the one thing that I think the game like the, the type of story that it tells and like the type of character narrative that it creates or if I've done my job well, what I want the game to create is one of my favorite superhero scenes in any medium that has ever been created. And that is the the subway car scene from Spider-Man 2 I had a feeling when he that stops the train. Say. That scene is anyone can wear the mask. When he stops the train and like he is hurt and they drag him and there is kind of an unnecessary Jesus analog that superhero media creators love putting in things. And I'm always like, eh, but like Comics really they, love they, their they, Christ they, imagery. <laughs> They really love their Christ imagery so, so much. Um, and then it's for me, like the entire core of anyone can wear the mask is it is a game about the moment that the kid hands Spider-Man his mask and says, don't worry, Spider-Man, we ain't going to tell nobody like that. I'm almost getting I, I almost just cried saying that scene because it's that <laughs> wonderful to me. <laughs> that is what I want this game to be about. Is it about a hero that saves people? 
and a city that recognizes that the hero is saving people. And when the hero needs it, like when the hero has their big downfall, the city stands up and says, we are not we are not going to let you do this on your own. Yeah. And it's from everything that I've gathered from everything you've tweeted about it is that it's very much a game about kind of that relationship between a hero Mm -hmm. and the city that they're in versus like so many people are so familiar with like the heroes that are protect the entire planet, protect the entire galaxy, Mm -hmm. whatever it is. And this is a game about the hero who's like, I protect this corner of this country really well. (laughs) This is where I stay. It is. And I think that like, and there are some settings and dials in the game where if you want to tell the Superman flies around the cosmos thing, (laughs) it just becomes like a city of a different size. But like really, truly the heart of the game is exactly what you're describing. It is, it is, it is Luke Cage and and Danny Rand open a, open a, a storefront on a street on like a city street corner. And that is their street corner. And it is, it is, we're going to fight this. Like we're going to defend this neighborhood. Like that to me is the heart of this game is. And, and what it, what it does that I love is so much of the game is just building a city and the people that are in it. Because every, every turn you introduce like a new physical location in the city and then and like a new person that exists in that space, because like that is something really, truly in every superhero comic that like I think I think every comic could use more of that, which is more Leslie Tompkins's and more like Fantastic Four mailroom attendant Willie. <laughs> it's not it's not Willie Loman. Oh, my. I have to I'm going to have to physically Google this real quick. And I Willie know it's not Loman important. is from that's from Death, Death, of, a Death of a Salesman. <laughs> Hold on. Sorry, my theater degree just Willie jumped Lumpkin. out. Willie Lumpkin. Like... <laughs> Thank you. No, I, that's why I said it, and I was like, it's not Willie Loman. <laughs> that's a much sadder story. <laughs> Willie Lumpkin is the Fantastic Four's mailman, and, no. like, those are the characters that I live for. Character, the, 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 the tiny, ordinary people that live in the city, the, uh, the, the photographer from Marvels, and, like, all of these ordinary people are... Yeah such an important part of like superhero mythology to me is that is ordinary people looking at these kind of modern day gods. And I'm really happy with the way that the game creates that space and creates these very real, very ordinary people. Yeah. I know a lot of the touchstones for this game that that you have brought up and that people have been discussing on Twitter and stuff are Superman and Spider-Man mm-hmm. and things like that. And I have very little comparatively knowledge of those stories. But the thing that kept coming to mind for me every time I've heard you explain this game to people, because I wrote a 70 page paper on Catwoman, this Mm -hmm. is the game that lets you tell one of my favorite Catwoman arcs from uh, the early 2000s, actually, when Mm -hmm. she comes back and is like, East End is mine and I'm just going to protect here. It's exactly that. It's exactly that. And it's, it's, I I also love that arc and it's exactly that. Yeah. So that's been one of my things where I'm like, I get that you're saying this is a Superman game, but weirdly enough, it's also a Catwoman game, (laughs) which I feel like you can't say about a lot of things. That's true. And that's kind of what I'm really pleased about it is like, I, I was writing it. I wrote so much of it with Superman in mind that like I kept, and once I kind of thought about, like the, the the fact that it does Superman, Spider-Man and Catwoman, like at three <laughs> vastly different power levels, partially because I think one of the, the keystones of the game for me, it's based on a game called Beyond the Rift by Deep Anyway, which also has this like central conceit, I think is the, the yeah. best word for it, which is that like in in Beyond the Rift, which is one of the big reasons that it ended up that like it cre- it reading that game led to me writing anyone can wear the mask is it says the, the the hero character, the protagonist character is always going to win. We do not care about a story where the door is locked and that is the end of the story. Like yeah. it is failure is a part of the story in that you are always going to be rolling a dice to determine like how much failure you have to go through to get to that success. But and I think like that's such it is a very good meta conceit that like maps out so perfectly to superheroes that like. 
make, taking that tiny conceit allows you to, from a game design perspective, do exactly what we were just talking about, where you can say, yeah, this is Superman, this is Catwoman, this is Spider-Man, this is whoever, <laughs> because like we flavor that failure to that character, right? Yeah. Like Catwoman, what, what it means when Catwoman fails is much different than what it means when Superman fails. Yeah. But we're not going to read the story where Catwoman just, yep, yeah, yeah, sorry, I lost. That's all me. Bye, y'all. And like, we're never going to read that story, right? There's there's a there's a meme comic. There's an old web comic that I love dearly. I haven't gone back and reread it in, in years. And this is going to date me as an inhabitant of the early 2000s. <laughs> there is a web comic called The Adventures of Dr. McNinja by Chris Hastings. Where there's a very early issue, a very early like one page comic about a Batman motif. I think he's fly man, I think. <laughs> and there's a thing where he jumps in the room. He's coming down from the rafters and the bad guys are shooting at him. And the last panel is just a dead body that falls and like thumps on the ground. And that's it. That's it. That's that character's journey. And it's like that's about what happens. But I, I the thing that I come back to the one of the guiding principles of anyone can wear the mask is the alt text of that comic, because it was a web comic in the early 2000s and therefore it had an alt text joke, was no one wants to read this Batman comic. And that was a guiding principle where I'm like, yeah. this isn't a this. You're never going to have the the scene where I rolled badly. Turns out the Joker just wins and poisons the reservoir. Yeah. Sorry. Like <laughs> that doesn't happen. That's not off. That's off the table. That's not in the game. And like I wanted that specifically. Yeah. So for listeners of our show, we have touched on a lot in the past about like I have said Young Justice was my introduction to mm -hmm. superheroes. And I feel like that is not uncommon among people who listen to right. us. So for fans of Young Justice and just the teen hero genre more broadly, are there any hallmarks of this show that are what like brings people to young justice that are part of anyone can wear the mask. Yeah. So there's, there's a few things that young justice, the super, super well that apply that map out really nicely to the way that, uh, anyone can wear the mask plays. There's, there's the thing that I think that it does really, really well that I think if like you are a young justice fan that like, is going to feel like very familiar to you is there's a sense of slow burn drama to it because like a mechanical piece of how the game works. Cause I think young justice does, we talked about it at the top of the show does slow burn does that slow burn villainous reveal nearly better than anyone else that any other show comic that I've seen, right? Like that season two reveal where they have been quietly showing you their hand that dark side is around the corner for two seasons. And you, and like you, you just, you get that inclination from episode one, that there is somebody in the background and they mm -hmm. just quietly piece by piece, like peel it back. And every time, every time the heroes accomplish something, there's that feeling of like, yeah, but there's something around the corner. This person said one line about like the person that I answered to and I didn't think that person answered. And like that feeling. Yeah. Is so good. And they do it so, so well that like that was something that I wanted to really specifically capture in the game as well as Young Justice does it. Because I'm like, I, I, it's it's the it's the measuring stick for me is like, can I can I capture that feeling? So the way that the game works is there's a Joker card that is in the bottom half of the deck. So you're flipping cards, you're telling stories, you're going issue by issue, scene by scene. Because this is and that a Joker card, card based. Uh, yeah. For people, for some of our listeners who might not know, because we talk about masks and we talk about D and D sometimes, right. which are dice based RPGs. Anyone can wear the mask is a uh, deck of cards based RPG, where you Correct. draw this cards a, to make decisions. Yeah, every so every turn, every turn, the city flips a card and that card tells you where the location is happening. And then the villain rolls a six sided die or puts the the city. The villain describes who is in danger in that scene, what horrible thing is happening and rolls a dice. And then the hero interprets that dice result to say either I save people, I couldn't save this person, etc. But 
the way that the game works is there's that Joker card, which represents like the nemesis level villain, right? It represents the worst possible person who emerges in the back half of the game specifically to just ruin the hero's day to like damage the city and hurt people and just and it's that feeling of there's this low key tension, right? There's this tension of I know something bad is coming. Yeah. And I know that there is something building that the villain is slowly putting together in the back of their minds of this is going to be the bad. This is going to be the bad, like the villain. This is the nemesis. And I'm watching that deck slowly drain. And I'm like, something bad is going to happen. And I don't know when it's going to happen. Yeah. And then when it does, it's that ultimate culmination of like, oh, no, everything has gone wrong. <laughs> yes, it is the showing the audience that there is a bomb under the table mm -hmm. and then just waiting. <laughs> and just waiting. And then the other thing that I think. I think the other thing that Young Justice does spectacularly well that I adore is it's such a clever decision on the part of making a TV show to make them a like strike force style <laughs> like ops team because then because they're able to create a mission of the week structure and that yeah. mission of the week structure is so good because it 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 lets them there's so much of that show that like I appreciated as a writer, like watching and being like, I so appreciate that they built themselves a structure where they're like, here's the action. Here's the thing you're focusing on. Don't pay attention to everything that's going on back here. We'll get to that. There's a more important thing happening in the forefront. And like that contrast between the big, the big villain reveal and the, the episode of the week structure is like, really that's the mechanical skeleton of anyone can wear the mask is where is when you flip cards they're like the issue by issue like oh captain cold is trying to use his freeze ray on a bank <laughs> and then quietly in the background zoom is like building up and dark side is gathering his pawns like yeah. that feeling is is so it's just such an effective contrast that i really tried to like pull it into this game as much as i could i yes definitely that the first season especially does that kind of mission of the week build so good. The other mm -hmm. seasons do it too, but I feel like as the seasons go on, there is a more and more of a push towards yeah. doing a, the larger, big, connected thing, and it's because of the way the team evolves, and it all makes perfect sense. But that first yeah. season is like, there is a monster of the week, but all of these monsters will be connected, but you're not mm -hmm. going to know why until it's too late. Yeah, you just quiet. It's, it's those... It's those one off lines that like every time when we were watching it, I remember those one off lines killed me where somebody somebody will mention somebody will mention the light and you just go, you're it's the Leonardo DiCaprio <laughs> meme of yeah. like I point at my TV like, huh, he's huh, got him. I don't know what it means, but I heard you. I heard what you said. Yeah. And watching and watching it in real time was so wild watching it one episode a week because it just meant everyone was speculating forever about everything all the time, always. That's the thing that I missed out on. And like, that's the thing that I regret missing out on because like Jen and I did so much of that <laughs> in between episodes that I'm like, I'd have loved to just be on Twitter, like just spamming her at work with links being like, check out this Twitter thread. Got some really compelling stuff. Here's a Tumblr post that really breaks down some really strong theories. And then both of us just quietly going, yeah, but it's dark side. But we know it's dark side. It's going to be dark side. Like, I, I remember the, like, big who was the mole debates from back in the day. Because there's the line where the light is just like, it's a good thing that we've placed our, our infiltrator into the all of that. And just kind of throws that out into the world. And we don't know who it is for months on end of watching this show. And there Agony. were theories ranging Agony. from the very obvious Artemis to people being like, it's Cheshire's mask, just her mask. <laughs> Incredible. Uh, and it was amazing to witness. <laughs> I missed out on this and I regret, and that is that is my young justice regret is missing out on the, the, the conspiracy theory specifically. Cause that's a that's 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 my jam. That is so specifically. I love ARGs. I, I love getting to baselessly speculate on things, which is partially why I love ARGs. 
So like a a theory heavy show like Young Justice is catnip to me because I can quietly assemble clues and just build my wall, my conspiracy wall and be like, (laughs) here you go. Here's everything. (laughs) Discuss. It's wonderful. I really I hope someone someday somewhere does like an archive project or something and just kind of gathers the chaos of the Young Justice fandom into being like this was 2012 <laughs> this this was what this was what was happening here the internet was somehow both smaller and more chaotic at the same time yeah who is to say conclude part one you've been listening to whelmed the young justice files podcast our hosts are rich howard and emily booza our editor and producer is neil powell Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours, under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed.